This chapter is on um, telescopes. Here's a nice picture as you look out into deep space. You see a lot of colorful objects. Most of these are galaxies of different sizes and shapes and uh, um, resolved into different colors. And uh, looking at this, we realize that um, everything we see is really due to the light that comes to us. And we discussed this at length in chapter 2, but in this chapter we want to see how we can actually get that light. So astronomy itself is an observational science. It's based on the light that gets to us. Most of these places, at least in our lifetime, we'll never get to. It's just too far away. So everything we get is through the observation of light. And our basic purpose for a telescope is to collect electromagnetic radiation and deliver that to a detector. Or in um, common words, that would be to collect a large amount of light and bring it to a focus so that we can see it and analyze it. So essentially, we can think of the telescope as a light bucket. Uh, in this picture here we've got um, the Hubble Space Telescope and we have a Atacama uh, Telescope in uh, Chile. And basically their idea is to collect as much light as they can with the largest possible telescope that you can without having detrimental effects due to the fact of the size of your telescope. Uh, in the case of Hubble, uh, it's not the largest telescope around, but um, it's in outer space or it's beyond Earth's atmosphere, so it can actually um, collect light without the detrimental effects of the Earth's atmosphere. But there are other factors as well in tr determining uh, how well a telescope will perform based on its size. We can get uh, two kinds of optical telescopes. One is by reflection and the other is by refraction. Here's how a reflection would work. To, to the right here we've got a uh, curved mirror. It's a parabolic curve, very close to being um, circular, but it's parabolic. And what happens is when the light rays come in and bounce off this mirror, they bounce off with an, an angle equal to their angle of incidence. So the angle that comes in is equal to the angle that goes out. And so as you see this curved mirror, it comes in at an angle here, and it comes out at an angle here. If you can imagine, at least at that moment, that the mirror is kind of flat in that locale where the light wave, light, uh, wave is incident on that mirror, that the angle in equals the angle out. As this curves around, the angle in equals the angle out, and we actually can get these light rays to focus in on a point. If your eye is just beyond that focus, it will appear to you that the real image of this object is coming from that focus point. And as we look at these light rays, the top rays coming in and then proceeding to the bottom, and the bottom rays coming in and proceeding to the top, that image will actually look inverted to you. Here's how a refracting lens works. If we have uh, uh, some glass and light passes from say the air or maybe even a vacuum into another substance, it tends to slow down. And it, as it slows down, it, um, it, it bends. So here in this glass prism here, we have one bend and then another bend as it, as it proceeds from the substance back into air. So we, we, we can actually bend or deflect this light to another location. Depending on how thick the glass is, we can alter how much we bend the light. The thicker it is, we bend it more, and the thinner it is, we bend it less. 
So imagine you have a lens, and in this case we have a uh, convex lens on both sides, and it's curved. Maybe I got an example here. We have a, a lens that's kind of curved, so it's thicker in the middle and thinner, thinner on the edge here. And so we're just looking at a cross section of this lens in our diagram here on the um, in the PowerPoint. If I were to divide this lens up into segments of triangular glass, it looks something like this. I have a little triangle on the top, a piece of a triangle in, in intermediate, then I have a rectangle and the same thing on the bottom. As these lights come in, a light ray on the top is going to be deflected more towards some point, a focus. A light ray coming into this intermediate section is going to be deflected a little bit less. Light rays right through the rectangular portion deflected almost not at all. And we can make that hence bend again to a focus. And if your eye is beyond that point, you will actually see the light rays coming to your eye and will appear to come from that focus point so you'll be able to see an image. Here's why refraction causes light to bend. Here's a, at least an example. Imagine that you're looking from the sky down onto some concrete and a concrete grass interface and there's a rolling barrel about to um, hit that interface. As it's rolling on the concrete, it just proceeds in a nice forward motion. But let's see what happens as this barrel is incident on the grass. As one end of the barrel hits the grass, it starts to slow down because it's hit a medium where it, its velocity is less. The other end of the barrel continues moving fast, so it kind of swings around and curves around as this imparts itself on the, on the grass. Hence, when it actually hits the grass in full, we actually have, have turned a certain angle and it continues on then through that new um, substance in a nice continuous manner. We can imagine that this is what happens when a light ray with a wave, wave front impacts itself onto glass. Part of it will start to slow down, it bends, and then continues on through the glass, causing this what we call refraction. So ultimately, we're forming an image. Here's an image of a comet incident on a reflect, reflecting surface, and it comes out. We, we can see the top rays, or the top part of the image, reflects out, ends up on the bottom, and the bottom part of the image reflects out, angle equal, equaling angle on the way out, and it comes out on the top. Same thing if I have light rays proceeding um, from the bottom of the source so that your ultimate image is actually going to be inverted in respect to the, the true uh, object. We want to look and compare these reflecting and refracting uh, telescopes. On the left here, we've got a reflector telescope. It's actually a prime focus reflector telescope. Uh, if I take this secondary mirror, mirror out, what's going to happen is uh, light will come in and be a full amount of light, reflect out this primary mirror, and focus to a point which we call the prime focus. In this form, that is the simplest design that we could have for a telescope. We only have one surface to worry about, the one parabolic mirror surface, um, focusing to one point, a prime focus. And if I want to make it better, then at some point I might put in a secondary mirror to deflect that prime focus to an eyepiece and our eye. On the right here we have a refractor telescope, and in this case we are actually going to pass our light through a lens so it'll actually be two optical surfaces to deal with. As we come to a focus, the focus will come before we come to the eyepiece 
which we'll receive to our eye. So we actually have to deal with two optical surfaces and also because of the um, um, problems that we might have in having a large lens, our light gathering capacity is less. We're going to have a smaller diameter of a, um, of a telescope here um, because of our, our limitations in the lens. So in this case, a reflector has an advantage over a refractor. A reflector can collect more light. As we'll see, more light means you'll actually get a brighter image. And um, we'll also show that you'll get a more, um, uh, you get, you'll be able to limit diffraction, so you'll be able to get uh, uh, more resolution. Here's another look at a refractor telescope. As we have light coming in, it um, proceeds through a lens and it's, it's been focused towards an eyepiece over here. As we said, one, one limitation of this kind of uh, telescope is that we actually have to worry about two surfaces. We have to polish and ground the two surfaces of the lens, the main lens here. Also, um, we're going to have as, as, um, as a basic problem of lenses is we're going to have chromatic aberration, which means that different colors of the light are going to be refracted a different amount of angle, and hence uh, we're going to end up with light separating a bit on its way to a focus. That's basically what Galileo had. He had a single lens refractor telescope. It had just been invented maybe about four years before he used it, and he built his own. But um, the, the uh, basic problem of the refractor was already evident that he had this chromatic aberration. In modern refractors, we would add a secondary lens of a different material um, of a concave type in order to help mitigate these uh, chromatic aberration effects. So an achromatic refractor will have a secondary concave lens of a different material to offset the aberration of the convex lens. So, mainly because of these limitations, modern telescopes are all reflectors, at least the ones that are used in um, astronomy doing research. Light traveling through a lens is refracted differently depending on the wavelength. That's what we call a chromatic aberration. And this is only affects refractors, not reflectors, because reflectors are just going to reflect the light and not actually going to pass through a lens surface or a glass surface. Some light traveling through a lens will be absorbed. So if you have a lens you're going to lose some of the light that's coming in because it's absorbed into the glass itself. Not a problem with reflectors because it never actually passes through a substance. A large lens can be heavy and can only be supported at the edge. And since glass is amorphous, it's actually a fluid, um, if you have a large lens, it's actually going to sink due to the gravity of Earth and hence it's going to, that's going to cause distortions over time. So the larger you make a lens, the, the more problems you're going to have over time. And hence um, a re, re, reflector doesn't have that problem, of course. A lens needs two optically acceptable surfaces. You need to grind it and polish it on both sides, whereas a, um, a mirror only needs one. And a mirror could be supported from its back side since you only need that one surface. So you could have it well supported on the back side. And in fact, you can even start changing its shape from the back side to make it even better. And you can't do that with um, a lens, which is already limited to, be, uh, to have its both sides already um, established. So all optical telescopes for a scientific nature greater than 40 inches in diameter, which would be 
greater than a meter in diameter are reflectors, at least in modern day. So let's look at some reflecting telescopes. This first example is what we call the simplest design, the prime focus reflector. Light comes in, reflects off a concave mirror, and, and focuses to a prime focus, and is collected there. Normally, if, if you were optically observing um, through your eye, this would not be ideal, because you'd have to put your head right at that prime focus. So if you had a collector, then this would be fine. But if you were Newton, you'd want to see the image, so you, you would modify this prime focus reflector and put in a secondary mirror at a 45 degree angle, a flat mirror. So basically, the light that comes in here, which was intended to focus at a point, will actually be redirected to focus um, in a perpendicular direction towards an eyepiece and towards your eye. So this flat piece here is at a 45 degree angle, and this is called a Newtonian focus. We can possibly improve this a little bit more by, by instead having a flat mirror, we can put in a convex mirror at, the, at that same point. So as the light is coming in, headed towards a prime focus, it hits a convex mirror and is actually determined to focus over a longer distance right back through your main mirror. So you actually have to drill a hole in your main mirror and then have your eyepiece right there. This is called a Cassegrain focus, and it's one of the more common, most um, um, reliable reflector telescopes there is. Um, it needs a secondary convex mirror. We can also add another mirror. So we would have a concave reflection mirror to a convex um, mirror, as if it were a Cassegrain focus, but then it comes back and then you have another flat mirror to redirect it to the side called a Naismith focus to a coup de room. And you could have that then projected into a large room and look at your image there. Here's a look at how the light might travel through a Newtonian reflector. Light's coming in, reflects out the primary mirror, headed towards a focus right straight back, but then we intercept it with a flat diagonal mirror at a 45 degree angle, and then it's redirected perpendicularly to an eyepiece. Here's a cast grain reflector. We've got light coming in, reflecting off the uh, main mirror, the main concave mirror. Here's a convex mirror that is uh, near our original opening here, and that's that's headed right back through a hole in the main mirror to our eye. Here's a Keck telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It basically is a cast grain focus. You've got light coming in, collected and, and reflect it off a main mirror, which is actually a hexagonal pattern of sections of mirror, uh, directed towards a secondary mirror here, which would be a um, uh, convex mirror, and then directed back through the main mirror to a, uh, a uh, well, actually towards the main mirror, but then actually a Naismith focus to the coup day room to um, analyze it there. There's a fellow working on that, and, and he's, his size of him is about the size of the secondary mirror. So the diameter of this telescope is about twice the previous large telescope in Mount Palomar uh, for a reflecting telescope. So I increased the size, making it the largest telescope of its kind at that time. The hexagonal mirrors, you know, it's just one surface so that it can actually use 
you can actually be, manipulate those sections of that surface and actually to to uh, offset the size of the mirror and some other atmospheric effects. That's called active optics, where it can be actually manipulated from behind the mirror. Here's the Yerkes telescope at the University of Chicago, actually located in um, Wisconsin. This is the largest refractor telescope with a 40 inch diameter refractor lens, about one meter. Let's see if I got a meter stick, about one meter in diameter. And the Keck uh, telescope in turn is 10 meters in diameter. So 10 times larger, meaning it can actually collect. Here's an example. Let's say this is one telescope of a certain size, certain diameter. And here's a telescope of twice that diameter. This is about twice the diameter of, of the other clock, the smaller clock. As you increase the diameter, you actually increase your total area by a factor of your diameter squared. So if my diameter goes up by 2, my area goes up by 4, 2 squared. I can get more light that way. Better than collecting uh, this light on film is actually to use a charge coupled device, CCD. What the CCD does is as the light hits um, the silicon wafers, it actually induces charge to be built up. And the magnitude of that charge can be collected. The magnitude of that charge is directly proportional to the intensity of the light. So you can actually put a digital value on the intensity of the light based on how much charge gets built up in these silicon locations. And so you get a digital pattern based on numbers of what your intensity is as a function of location. Once you digitize it, you can then you know, further analyze it and actually refine it, maybe, um, maybe smooth out your, um, your numbers a little bit more and get a more refined image. You can store it and save it for later much better, 20 times faster than film itself because it's collecting all your, your, um, your photons at once. So it can be enhanced and analyzed easily and in this particular case we can identify a uh, resolution of two objects. And with further analyzation we can find that these objects actually were um, flying saucers. No, maybe not. But this is the best way to get light from distant galaxies because you, you only have uh, so many photons from a distant galaxy so you want to take advantage of every photon you can to get a good image and that would make uh, the CCDs a better, um, a better option than say film. Once you get that kind of um, image you can further analyze it using computers to sharpen the image. Here's a picture of a ground base uh, image that was later analyzed. And actually here's the same image taken by the raw Hubble which actually had a uh, distortion due to the fact that its, um, its uh, main mirror was not um, polished correctly. So in the raw Hubble it was you know, a little bit better than ground based, but still not as not as well as what was being expected from the Hubble telescope. So from a computer um, analyzation, we actually was able to enhance the Hubble Space Telescope pictures while we waited in order to repair the Hubble and actually got a better picture and more resolution of the location of these stars. And finally, when the Hubble was repaired, it actually got even better, where you could actually see a whole much, much better resolution and uh, discern many more stars in that loca location.
Speaking of the Hubble, one advantage of the Hubble is it is beyond our atmosphere. So it can collect light without the atmospheric effects, effects of the Earth. And the Hubble has, it's not the largest telescope, but because of that advantage, it, it does come up with better images than your ground-based telescope. It can measure in the infrared, visible, and ultraviolet ranges quite easily. It's got uh, measurements or instruments for all those. And of course, it has the advantage of being above the Earth's atmosphere. Here's the advantage of telescope size, at least for reflectors. If you can increase its size, you can collect more light. As we said, as the size goes up in diameter, it goes the the di uh, the um, area goes up as the diameter squared. So, light gathering power, the the way that we can grab more light, goes as the square of the diameter of the lens. The light, the right image here was taken with the lens. That was twice the size of the left image, giving you better, a better and brighter image. What also goes up is your resolution. Here are multiple telescopes on Mauna Kea, again on uh, that extinct volcano in Hawaii. It is above the clouds, uh, um, so. It doesn't have to worry about that part of the Earth's atmosphere, at least the weather part of the Earth's atmosphere. It does have a thinner Earth, Earth's at, atmosphere above it. But these multiple telescopes on Mauna Kea can, be, can improve their resolution by interferometry. And we'll talk about that in a moment. If we can maintain the same phase relationship, then we can basically treat these two telescopes as one large telescope and then we can increase our di diameter, our light gathering power and our resolution based on that. Here's another example, the very large telescope VLT in Chile. Here's Chile and here's a very large telescope in Chile. Now what we're actually referring to is the VLT, the Very Large Telescope in Atacama, Chile, which is actually four telescopes allowing for better resolution of, um, of, of the images that come in. Because if you can get these four in, into phase, then, then the, uh, the um, effect would be having a telescope of the same size of the spacing of all these telescopes. Here's what we're talking about when we're talking about resolving power. That's our ability to distinguish between two close objects that are far away. It's limited by the, the diffraction of the telescope. If you look at here, we have a opening here and um, if light comes in, if the opening is actually on the um, same size as the light, the light will actually bend due to that opening and it will, it will spread out. And you, the more it spreads out, the more that two objects will cease to become distinguishable from each other. And so you start getting these fuzzy shadows when you're trying to look at an object. turns out that the minimum angular separation of two sources that can be distinguished by a telescope depends on the wavelength of the light that you're trying to look at and the diameter of the telescope. If I can make the diameter bigger, I'm going to have less diffraction uh, due to that surface because the diameter won't be so much on the order of the light, that, uh, the wavelength that we're trying to look at. This is called the diffraction limit. In terms of radian arc seconds, the angle in measured in arc seconds, the diffraction limit is equal to 1.22 times the wavelength of the light you're looking at divided by the diameter of the telescope. To have better resolution, we want the smallest angle so that we can actually de determine two objects from each other. 
So a bigger diameter gives us a smaller angle, and that in increases our resolution, whereas a longer wavelength actually decreases our, re our resolution. So it goes inversely as the diameter of the telescope. So better resolution depends on reducing this diffraction limit, hence increasing our resolution. Radio telescopes have poor resolution than optical telescopes. The reason is, even though radio telescopes are huge, and they can, they can be made much bigger than optical, optical telescopes, uh, we'll talk about a radio telescope that has 305 meters in diameter. And compared to, say, a refractor telescope, the Yerkes, that was one meter in diameter, that's, that's uh, two orders of magnitude larger in diameter. The problem is the wavelength of radio waves is several orders of, orders of magnitude larger than optical wavelengths, many orders of magnitude larger. So you're increasing your numerator here by more than two um, um, magnitudes of, of wavelength, while you can increase your diameter of your telescope larger by maybe two magnitudes of of uh, diameter. So your optical resolution for a radio telescope is much smaller. The resolution is much smaller, your, your diffraction limit is much bigger. Here's an effect of finer resolution. Here's 10 minutes resolution. If we decrease that resolution angle to one minute, we can start seeing some objects distinguish themselves. Decrease it down to five seconds and we can see a whole bunch of bright objects that we couldn't see before. And increase the resolution down to one second and we can see all sorts of detail in this object as we go down to one second distinguishing more, more um, stars that we couldn't see before in this galaxy. Here's another picture of the Atacama uh, Telescope in Chile. And actually, here's a laser um, beam directed at the galactic center. You can see the Milky Way right here real clearly. And here's a locator to hit a laser beam at the galactic center. It's kind of a neat picture. Um, there's one possible problem with uh, directing the laser at the center of the galaxy. Sometimes the galaxy might strike back with its own laser beam right back at your telescope and that could eliminate one of your telescopes hence reduce your resolution from in this case from four down to three and you really want want, want that to happen so got to be careful sometimes another uh, aspect um, reducing the resolution is our ability to see, especially through the atmosphere. Not necessarily from the opacity of the atmosphere, because there is going to be some absorption, but more, more to, due to the turbulence of the atmosphere. The fact that the atmosphere is moving around, and due to the temperature and this movement, there's going to be very small locations, which we might call microclimates, Whereas light is coming through, it's going to be refracted through those small locations, and it's going to be pushed around and moved back and forth as it comes to our eye. Hence, this causes twinkling of the light sources, like stars, as they're twinkling. It's due to this light just moving around through the turbulence in the atmosphere through these microclimates as it finally gets to our eye. As this refers to a concept called seeing, when this point of light, say from a star, is moving around, and it can't be resolved in any one point. So as it moves around, we kind of just get a fuzzy image of it, and hence our resolution has been reduced, because instead of seeing a point light, we see just a fuzzy light, because it's moving around all over the place. And hence, we have these problems as we're trying to look at light through our atmosphere. 
So it looks something like this. Looking out at the sky at night, you see the twinkling stars, especially when, uh, when there's a lot of air movement and a lot of temperature change. It's just because the light itself is refracting through the atmosphere. It has nothing to do with the star itself. Uh, the light from the star is, is perfectly fine until it reaches the Earth's atmosphere and, and then pass through that to our, to our own eyes. So this instability is due to the Earth's atmosphere causing it to twinkle. It's a major factor limiting the ground-based optical telescopes. Radio telescopes don't have this problem. The, 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 the radio, radio signals will not be um, refracted as much and you won't see this twinkling effect. Here's a look at greater resolution of an object down to five seconds. Solutions to the atmospheric blurring put telescopes on mountaintops, especially in deserts. That's why we have those uh, telescopes on top of Mauna Kea. They're at the top of a volcano. They're above all the weather and they're above most of the thickness of the atmosphere. So you have a thinner atmosphere and you have less um, atmospheric problems to deal with. Put telescopes in space. With the Hubble telescope, you're out in space. You don't have any atmosphere to worry about. So you don't have to worry with uh, active or adaptive optics to deal with the atmosphere. I mentioned adaptive, adaptive optics. You can use adaptive opt optics to physically reshape your mirrors and account for atmospheric fluctuations. So if you reshape them and you, if you have a, a control that knows how the atmosphere is changing at that moment, you can reshape your mirrors immediately to help account for those changes and help reduce this. Um, here's a look at active optics and adaptive optics. In particular, Adaptive optics will manipulate secondary mirrors and your waveforms in order to account for these atmospheric changes. The feedback will then change the mirror. For active optics, it's actually on the primary mirror. If you have a primary mirror like this reflector, and uh, you only need one reflective side, so on the other side, you can have little little force poles that can actually move your mirror around and adapt and, and reshape your mirror to make it better. That would be active optics on a main mirror. Most of the time when we're talking about manipulating these waveforms, we're talking about adaptive optics, just manipulating uh, secondary mirrors or the waveforms. Radio astronomy. We mentioned this. Resolution is not as good as optical, but it does have some advantages. It's similar to optical re reflecting telescopes. In this particular design, as we see here in this picture here, this is a prime focus radio telescope. So the light's coming in, coming to a point. We can have that focus right there, and it's the simplest design we can have. Less sensitive to imperfections due to the longer wavelength, it can be made very large, much larger than optical telescopes. That will help <clears throat> improve its resolution to some extent. Here's the world's largest telescope, radio telescope, 305 meter dish at Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Uh, 305 meters is 1,000 feet. So it's, I'm not sure which one they were really going for, but it's exactly 1,000 feet um, in diameter. Huge, uh, huge uh, telescope, more than three football fields long. And that helps increase its uh, resolution. It's prime focus because you got your focus right here at a location right opposite the, uh, the dish itself. Longer wavelength means poorer angular resolution in, in general for radio astronomy. So you've got those drawbacks. You can make the collection bigger, but you're going to have poor angular resolution because you have a longer wavelength. How our advantages are you can use this around the clock, 24 hours a day. You're not going to have the atmospheric effects 
that you do with uh, optical telescopes. So it can be used on Earth, no need to be in space for radio astronomy. Weather doesn't interfere, clouds, rain, snow, collect at any time of day. And you can collect at different radio frequencies, so you can get dif different information from entirely different frequencies, collecting over the whole radio range. So that's the advantage of radio astronomy. Here's the very large array, interferometer array. It combines many, uh, many uh, radio telescopes into basically one big telescope. If you can use interferometry, which is, it, which is the effect of trying to match the phase of all these telescopes, so it seems like they're all collecting at the same time, then effectively you are creating a large disk. I mean, the, your effective collection is similar to if you had a disk the size of the diameter of all the spacing of all these smaller telescopes, at least in terms of resolution. So as long as your phase is maintained, the resolution will be that of a dish whose diameter is equal to your largest separation between all these disks. Here's what we mean by maintaining phase for interferometry. Let's say you have light coming into these two telescopes. It's possible that the light is coming in at basically different different locations, so there's a slight time difference between this light coming in. And because of that, if we try to compare these two waves, they may not be um, aligned with each other. And in fact, in this case, we've got light coming into one telescope, light coming into another telescope. As we compare these waveforms, one's going up while one's going down. So actually we would have destructive interference as we try to add these two wavefronts together. We want to have a full collection of this light so that we can we can um, get more and more light. So we don't want it to destructively interfere, we want it to constructively interfere. So we need to be able to change the phase of one of these um, collectors as opposed to the other so that we can make it constructively interfere. Here's an example of two light light uh, beams coming in, in phase. As they're in phase, one's doing the same as the other. Hence, when we add them, they just get larger. We get more amplitude, we get a better signal, and hence they're, they are in phase. We get constructive interference. So when we're talking about uh, interferometry, we want all of our signals from all the telescopes to be in phase with each other, and then we can collect over more distance. With that kind of interferometry and larger area, we can get some images, at least in some cases, where radio images have a resolution that is uh, close to optical. Here's a radio image on the left an optical image of the same object on the on the right, a visual image. Still visual is better because you have more uh, light, light collecting capability. But um, as far as resolution, we can kind of get on that order in this particular case. You can try to do infer interferometry with visible light, but it's much more difficult because of the uh, the it's harder to match the phase of shorter wavelengths. The, the shorter the wavelength gets, the better your timing has to be, the better your computer capability would have to be, and the harder it is to add those together. So, and especially if you're trying to use telescopes that were further away from each other. So we have these two here um, using interferometry for visible wavelengths, but as you try to add more, it would be much more difficult to do. Infrared can image where visible radiation is blocked. Uh, here's an example. We, we're looking at a visual object in the sky, and it, we're actually blocked by interstellar uh, gases 
that tend to uh, disperse the visual image. But if we use uh, infrared, which is only focusing on the, the heat capability of these objects, we can actually locate these stars that are behind those interstellar gases and actually get more, um, get a better image, at least if that were our intent to actually see these objects. Infrared has problems with the atmosphere as well, so you want to get as, as far beyond our Earth's atmosphere as you possibly can. So you might use a, a high-flying balloon to do that. Uh, put your telescope on a balloon and, and, and let it go as high as it possibly can to get above the Earth's atmosphere. Or use the Hubble uh, telescope and look at the infrared there where you're already beyond the Earth's atmosphere. There's other um, other astronomies, um, other ways to collect using telescopes. When we're collecting light through all the spectrum of light, so you've got uh, radio, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, and if you go at the higher energies, X-ray and gamma rays. X-rays will not reflect off mirrors as wave, other wavelengths do, like uh, infrared and ultraviolet and vis visible. So you need other techniques in order to focus x-rays. They will glance off metal if you have a small glancing angle. So in order to focus your x-rays, you could create a glancing condition where the light comes in and, and comes at a small angle off your metal surfaces and have that metal surface bend so you repeatedly focus to a point. So instead of parabolic mirrors, you would have cylindrical metal surfaces that that um, uh, kind of focus down into a point, and hence you could collect your X-rays that way at a very shallow angle. We call this grazing incidence, where it comes in at a small angle, just grazing these um, metal surfaces uh, to a focus. Here's an x-ray image of the supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A, and it's really not an optical image, but what has happened is we've collected the x-ray, and then it's been assigned different uh, um, frequencies in the x-ray range have been assigned colors to make it look like an optical image. And so you can get a nice image of that supernova remnant. This is courtesy of the Chandra. X-ray observatory in space, um, a very uh, key uh, observatory that is constantly collecting X-ray images in space. Other astronomies, gamma rays, astronomies, gamma rays cannot be focused at all. They're too high energy, and they're really comprised of of particles. So you can collect them and maybe get a magnitude of your collection. You can't focus it. You can get a coarse collection. And this type of observing was pioneered by the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the GRO. Why would you collect gamma rays? Well, any, any kind of different uh, frequency, different energy of light will give you different information about an object. Hence, you can learn more and more about that object just by looking at the whole spectrum of what, what's out there. Here's a look at, at the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, using different parts of that spectrum. This one in particular is in the radio wave uh, wavelength. This is carb carbon oxygen, or uh, carbon monoxide emission. Here's looking at using the hydrogen 21 centimeter emission, also in the radio wavelengths, but a different frequency. Here's what the Milky Way looks using gamma rays. So you can identify the true hot spots in the galaxy. Here's what the Milky Way looks like using infrared. 
and here's the optical composite of all these together making a nice image of the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy. So summary of chapter 3. Refracting telescopes make images with a lens, while reflecting telescopes make images with a mirror. There are advantages with reflecting over refracting because of this. Modern research telescopes are all reflectors. Charge coupled devices are used for data collection because they can collect more photons than say a film image. And data can be formed, analyzed, and um, 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 the get more resolution that way. Large telescopes gather more light. This is, has two main advantages. It can actually give you more brightness because the area goes as your diameter squared and you can get better resolution because resolution, the smallest angle resolution goes as your inversely as your diameter so you can get better resolution with a larger diameter. Resolution of ground-based optical telescopes is limited because of atmospheric effects. Resolution of radio or space-based telescopes doesn't have this problem but they do have the problem that, that all resolution has, and that is by diffraction. Active or adaptive optics can minimize atmospheric effects. Adaptive optics in particular can change the waveform and minimize atmospheric effects of, of light being twinkling around. Radio telescopes need large collection area. Diffraction is limited because the radio wavelength is so long. So you want as large a telescope area as you can possibly get. And you can actually increase your resolution by using interferometry, by matching the phase of many telescopes together, especially in radio um, collection. Infrared and ultraviolet telescopes are similar to optical telescopes. They can collect light in similar ways. Ultraviolet telescopes must be above the atmosphere, though, um, just because of our ozone layer. So we, our ozone layer actually absorbs 99% of the ultraviolet light um, that's coming towards the Earth. So if you really want to collect ultraviolet light, you need to go above the atmosphere, say use the Hubble telescope. X-rays can, can be focused by using the grazing angle off of metal surfaces, but um, you don't use a lens in that sense. You don't use an optical lens. You use a metal cylindrical lens, um, or if you can call it a lens, a medical cylindrical uh, grazing device that will focus the light. Gamma rays can be detected and can be um, quantified but cannot be imaged. They can't be focused. That concludes this chapter 3 on telescopes.